everyone. Uh, yeah, it's great to be part of the first virtual INOC uh, in history uh, and being the first speaker. Uh, I'm going to talk about source routing on the edge, scale, reliability, and programmability for XRing's internet peering. Um, Here's my agenda. I'll try to introduce, introduce myself in a second. Uh, I'll talk about state of packet forwarding and usual networks, um, as it is in the case with most networks out there. Uh, requirements of modern packet forwarding uh, from our perspective. Uh, and then I will talk about our solution. And later on, um, yeah, questions. I guess it's a bit hard here to uh, have questions. Um, just ask them after the talk and I'll answer, answer them in, on Slack then. So who am I? My name is Oliver Herms. I'm also known as uh, TACT. I'm a senior network engineer. I work in Exoring AG uh, in Munich. I live in uh, Southwest Germany in Karlsruhe. I'm a friend of Boston's reliability and velocity in software and um, network automation enthusiast, uh, the Golang and GRPC fanboy. Um, and now I'm going to talk about state of packet forward. So as Exoring AG, we have a product called Vipro TV, which is a TV streaming uh, platform. And as that, for that, we operate a network uh, that is basically only used as a CDN. Um, a part of the network you can see here. Uh, what you can see is the, the round things here. These are our routers. Uh, this is just four of our more routers that we have at the moment. Um, and we have to make sure that video data makes it from these edge web servers in, let's say, Frankfurt and Leipzig, for example, to ISPA. Um, and with the regular um, BGP path decision making things that we have, uh, from vendors, um, we only can use the shortest path. So our edge servers are dual home connected to both core routers here. They have two default routes usually. So 50% of flows go to core one, 50% go to core two. Uh, and then it goes by the shortest path straight to ISPA. And this link here is fairly limited. It just has 10 gigs capacity. And yeah, that's how it is. The 20 gigs over the IXP or the 100 gigs over a remote metro via another ISP, they don't get utilized automatically. Um, which is not too nice. So here's the limitations. Um, yeah, packets to an ISP follow a single shortest path or a number of equal paths, as I said. And um, all active links even get the same amount of traffic. So that means even if we tweak um, paths that they become equal or equal cost, um, they are still limited by uh, the amount of capacity that the smallest link has uh, multiplied by the amount of links that we have. So let's say we have a 10 gig and 100 gig link um, and each of them get 50% of traffic. It means you have 20 gig usable capacity and that's it. Um, yeah, and what is equal can be done administratively but needs to be done manually. Um, when we come to the next point, traffic engineering can make use of non-shortest paths um, but that means we have to manually tweak route attributes and that's actually dangerous because mistakes can cause outages. Prefixes can disappear, prefixes can be rerouted over paths that are even, even, uh, have, even have less bandwidth than the one that we want to free from congestion. Um, and we can only do this on a per prefix basis, so on IP ranges, which means it's at least a slash 24, meaning 256 IP addresses or even up to 2 million IPs are in the IP address blocks that we use for routing. And it requires changes to router configs, which we don't like because we fully generate them, but we still re review them manually. And what we actually would like to have is something that reacts completely automatically. Um, so we want to have a solution that works without changing router config. Um, also, limitation of current state is that all routers in our path need to know about the full IP internet routing table. And memory is limited. Um, expensive licenses are required for 100,000 plus routes on the platforms that we use. Um, and that limits future growth with the current platform. At the moment, we only have a few 10,000 routes in the, uh, in the routing table um, because we only need prefixes in Central Europe and nothing more at the moment. But that might change in the future and then it will not fit on our routers anymore. So we need a solution for that. Um, and this fact that we need all have, have these many prefixes in the FIP um, stops us from even buying cheaper routers. So here are requirements for solution that uh, we would like to have actually. So actually what we want is that traffic uh, utilizes all these paths in this graph that are marked red. So for example, first we want to fill the 10 gig line with directly with ISPA. We want to go to ISPA. If that is full, uh, we can then use the second cheapest link, which is uh, the link over an IXP, for example, here on the left hand side. And if that also runs full, we want it to automatically move some traffic over to uh, the remote metro Leipzig here, move it to ISPB, and then ISPB move it to ISPA. Um, so here are uses of requirements. So we want to make sure that non-equal speed links are actually usable 
and completely usable. And we want to make sure that non-equal cost links are usable as well. And we automatically want to maximize the utilization of the cheapest links and automatically move excess traffic to the next cheapest link. Um, and we want to allow to take link quality into account in routing decisions. So if there is a link that has uh, CSC errors, for example, even in a remote network, uh, we want to be able to um, make, this, make uh, routing decisions to route around this. Um, but it's a complete story of its own to detect this. And um, but at least we have a solution now that allows us to reroute traffic. Um, and of course, we want to react to changes, qu changes quickly and repair any situation automatically if possible. Uh, and that includes congestion due to um, capacity going down and reroutes being necessary. So nice to have would also be not to change router configs, as I said, because our router configs are automatically generated and uh, we are still reviewing them manually and I don't think we will change that pretty, anytime soon. Um, it would be nice to have support for arbitrary amount of routes because uh, we have Q of X 10K and we are allowed to have like 100,000 routes, but it would be nice if we would have uh, prefixes to all destinations uh, in our network, but maybe not on the routers. Um, and it would be great to have uh, to, uh, a way to do traffic engineering on a per IP address basis and not just on a prefix basis because prefixes are too coarse. So here comes the solution. Um, solution is to let vendor routers forward the traffic still, but not route it because routing is, uh, uh, as I pointed out, is too inflexible to meet our needs on the vendor boxes. Um, so the solution is actually source routing to so let the source of the traffic decide which path a packet takes. And the idea is that servers send labeled packets to the routers and the routers then just um, interpret these labels. So packets get encapsulated into tunnels um, that lead straight to the egress router and the egress router then uh, takes a look into a label and the label makes the decision where a packet goes next. Um, means we have labeled packets arriving at routers um, and these, these routers have only do static forwarding with static LSPs. Um, and this MPLS label on the packet uh, indicates which next top is to be used. So basically there's a rule that says uh, if there's MPLS label 100, pop the label and forward it out to this particular next top, which is actually an EVGP peer. Um, and let the router ignore the IP routing table. So yeah, advantages. Yeah, it lost very fine granular control of link utilization because we can implement arbitrary uh, path decision making in, in, uh, in SDN controller um, and let they, they make decisions and push routes out to machines and get stuff into tunnels and get it labeled. Um, yeah, and there's no need for IP routing on routers anymore because routers only forward MPLS uh, labeled packets and that will save CAPEX. Um, so here comes how the data plane of this works. So on the data plane, um, the packet is being sent by an edge web server, like here in Leipzig, for example. And this is the routing table on the right side here. And you can see paths here to ISPA, ISPB, and there's a label assigned and a tunnel interface and a weight. Um, the cool thing on the weight thing is that uh, Linux is able to do weighted cost multipathing, which uh, the most, ven most vendors out there are not able to do, as I pointed out. So, um, this allows us to have like two paths to ISPAB here, one with label 2000, one with label 2001, going to different routers and have a weight on them on 10 gig and 20 gigs, which means one sort of traffic takes this path and two sort of traffic will take this path. And this makes it possible to have actually 30 gigs usable capacity instead of just 20 with ECMP. Um, so this is what the, the Linux machine does. It labels the packet, the IP packet, and sends it into a tunnel that goes to, let's say, core 01401. Um, on this router, core 01401, as you see up here, uh, is a configuration saying label 1000 means pop the label, and the next stop is this IP address. And this IP address is that ISPA's router on the peering here. Um, yeah, and these, these here are actually tunnels that are unidirectional. So here in between is our physical network that transports uh, packets around between servers and uh, edge routers. Um, yeah, there's MPLS level switching path, as I said, um, and that must be configured. It's static. Um, um, and the level switching path allows choosing the next top per label. So what we have is a configuration like this. It says, in, in, this is a Jonas configuration. It says protocols MPLS, static level switching path, and then it says coffee, and here's is the IP address of the next top encoded, basically. 
Um, it's a transit LSP with this value. So if a packet with this label value arrives, um, the next top is 62691461.95, and the label is being popped. Um, and this way, so whenever a packet arrives with this label, it is made sure that the packet actually goes to this uh, peer. Um, but how do we get the packets to a peering router in the first place or on the edge router? Um, we have two options. We can do full MPLS deployment on the internal network and just have a MPLS label stack. We could use ISI segment routing, for example, or LDP or even RSVP. Or we could place MPLS in a tunnel with MPLS over GRE and IP or MPLS over UDP IP. Um, MPLS over GRE works fine on Juniper MX, but doesn't work on QFX 10K. But luckily, since Junos 18.2 or so, uh, MPLS over UDP is uh, supported. So what we do is we encapsulate IP in MPLS, put that into UDP, and that into IP. Um, so this is actually the packet stack um, as the packet leaves the machine. So first comes the IP address um, of the tunnel destination, which is core 1401, for example. Then there's a UDP header that just says port 6635, which is a reserved port for MPLS and UDP. Um, we have an MPLS label that determines what the next stop is. And then comes the actual IP packet as it used to be leaving our machines and just being routed through the network. Um, so on the Linux machine, to get the packets out of the box, um, there's not too much one needs to do, luckily. Uh, we need to create a foo over UDP, uh, FOU encapsulated SIT tunnel per router. Uh, and that takes a few steps. We need to load the module FOU. We need to assign a port 6635, which is the default port for FOU, uh, for uh, MPLS over UDP. And F OU, it's like full of UDP, it just encapsulate anything into UDP. So if we let point routes with MPLS labels into a tunnel of um, type SID with FOU encapsulation, it will just uh, yeah, build this, label uh, this packet stack, basically, or header stack. Um, so then after adding the port, we need to add the tunnel itself, IP link add name, and then there's this is CN, stands for the CDN, and then there's uh, core router or one, fra or one, tunnel zero. Um, this remote thing here is the IP address of the router, the local IP address, the TTL, NCAP FOU, this is the important part to have the, uh, the UDP header on it, uh, source port 6635, and uh, port, uh, destination port 6635, and that's it. Um, and then we have a tunnel that actually works. Now, we have to have the routes pointing into the tunnel. That actually works. Um, therefore, we need MPLS IP tunnel uh, kernel module, and we need MPLS GSO. I will later maybe have a few minutes to talk about MPLS GSO, because this is not automatically loaded. causes issues if you don't have it. Um, so then we add a route that say IP route at 192.0.2.0.24. I want to encapsulate it with an MPLS label for 123 and send that to, to, send that to core 01 for 01. Then we would use this command to have this. This is actually everything that is necessary to do on the sending part. Now we have to teach our QFX 10K to actually decapsulate the packets. And we do that over a firewall filter. So we have a firewall filter configured on every border router um, that matches on a certain destination prefix list, where usually per machine or per router there is, um, there's one IP address in, and that's the destination IP address that is being assigned to the tunnel here in this step. Um, and then we match on protocol UDP, destination port 6635. Um, and the action then is decapsulate MPLS in UDP. And that will just cut off the IP uh, the U the, and the UDP header, take whatever is in there as an MPLS label, interpret the MPLS label according to the MPLS switching table, and forward the packet. That's basically it. Um, that's the data plan. But how does the control plan work, which is a more interesting part, I guess. Um, Requirements. So first of all, we need to calculate a routing view per region because um, there's no not one global view. Um, so if I have a server in, in Frankfurt, I would like to use exit uh, paths in Frankfurt, ideally, and in Leipzig, I would like to use those in Leipzig, obviously. Um, so all machines in the region should have the identical routing tables, but only within the region, not in a global network. Um, it must be reliable, so it must survive machine failures, and it must, su it must support um, in service software update ISSU and actually we made it work. It really works um, if you do it properly. Um, it must be scalable, so it must support 100 plus clients per region, a growing internet routing table, and a growing number of peerings, of course. And it must be programmable, so allow administrative changes to default routing decisions. Um, and this administrative 
actually at the moment means we do it manually, but in the future we want to do this completely automatically, which is not there yet. Um, so getting routes from routers, how does that actually work? We make use of BMP data, but how? What, what is BMP actually? So BMP, BGP is the BGP monitoring protocol. Um, um, it sends all received routes to monitoring stations. So it's configured on routers. And every BGP message that is received actually gets replicated to this monitoring station. Um, not, mon monitoring stations also get notified about peer up and down events. Um, and you can choose if uh, you want to have these updates pre or post policy. Post policy means everything that is rejected by a routing policy is not getting reported to the monitoring station. And that's what we use, we use post policy uh, because we have routing policy stuff and filtering going on there and I need that uh, for the SDN world, of course, as well. So we use post policy. Um, we use the bio routing route information service for this. Um, it's open source. Uh, you can find on GitHub course slash bio routing slash bio RD. Um, yeah, it receives these BMP messages and it tracks per router, VRF, and BGP peer adjacency ribbon state. Uh, and that state is being exposed via GRPC. Um, this is a Diagram of how this actually works. This is the whole process. Um, on the top left side, we have the router R1. There's a BMP server running inside this process that uh, just um, uh, decodes all the BMP messages and it then realizes, ah, there's this router. So it creates an object R1. Within this R1 object, there is a VRF object, let's say the master or VRF 1, 2, whatever. And within that, there's peers. Um, whenever they get, it gets a peer up notification, it adds this structure here. And for each peer, it then adds an adjacency rib in uh, called i0.0, i0.6.0. Um, and those contribute to a lock rib. Um, and stuff that is in this lock rib routing table is then being exposed as via a gRPC server. So we can do longest prefix matching. We can dump the whole rib, or we can observe the rib. And observe rib is what we use in the SDN controller then to get all the routing information into the, into the, the SDN world. Um, yeah, as I said, the route information service allows streaming routing information per router and VRF, and that's what we use. So we use the gRPC streaming RPC for this. Um, there's a call, that, uh, there's an app RPC called Observe RIP. Um, it's an endless stream, so we endlessly read from that and get BGP updates encoded in, uh, in uh, gRPC messages, basically. Um, on connecting, uh, the risk dumps the whole table and sends it out. And then after that, only there's updates coming via that, as soon as something comes in via VMP. So the SCN controller stands for decision making. Um, it's written in Go, uh, as well as the, the risk is. Um, it discovers the MPLS labels uh, to next top, label to next top mapping from our IPAM. Um, so every, uh, MP, every EGP next top that exists in our network uh, has an MPLS label map to it, and this mapping is being discovered uh, from our IPAM. Um, the controller then calculates the shortest path based on BGP data per region, per prefix, of course, and it takes into account the usual BGP attributes, local pref, AS path, MED origin, and the internal cost to the next stop. Um, it also takes traffic engineering input and allows overwriting BGP path information. Um, at the moment, this is done manually. We want to do this automatically in a moment in the future, um, but there's quite some work to be done still. Um, yeah, the Turkey engine controller is under development. It's gonna be multi-instance, but single leader um, it, um, software. Um, it takes that again, that will take input from open config streaming telemetry to know what state each interface is in. Is action necessary? Is the interface running full? Is it dropping packets? Uh, we will then use NetFlow collector, probably TFlow version two, uh, to find out what traffic is going there and make decisions on what traffic to move away from there. Um, and it will also then use the risk information to have an idea what alternative paths are available to reach certain destinations. Um, yeah, the route controller then streams its decisions. Uh, so it's basically its routing table to the local machines. Uh, again, via gRPC streaming RPC. So it's an endless stream of information um, that just blocks whenever the updates are done and then this path decision being done and something changes, the update is getting sent out, just like with BGP, basically. Um, and new clients receive a full dump, of course, um, so that they get the, the, their routing information when they come back up. Um, the route attribute that we are sending there is the prefix. Um, the exit route has tunnel IP address 
that MPLS that we want to place on the uh, on the on the route uh, and wait to uh, allow for weighted cost multipathing, basically. And then there's the route agent. The route agent is on the uh, right hand side, basically consuming then the routes um, from the SDN controller. It's also written in Go. Um, it makes sure that necessary kernel modules are automatically being loaded, so namely FOU, MPLS IP tunnel, and MPLS GSO. Um, it configures the tunnels to all routers, so it queries our data center inventory service to find out which routers exist in our network. And for each and every router that exists in the network, um, a tunnel is being established. Also, it maintains uh, the machine's routing table, so it receives the updates from the route controller and uses NetLink to replace or delete routes in the Linux kernel. So this is the whole picture, basically. On the left, very left-hand side, we can see the routers. They send the BMP updates to the local RIS instances. Uh, in this example, here, there are three. Practically, we will have two, probably. Um, at the moment, we have two, so I guess it will say like that. Um, so the cores in Frankfurt, they send their routing tables via BMP to RIS1 and RIS2 in Frankfurt. And then there's the, lock, the, the route controller, the RC, in Frankfurt that consumes from all the RIS uh, instances globally because they should also know that they could send traffic from Frankfurt to Leipzig for traffic engineering reasons. So they're consuming from everyone. And then the route agents in Frankfurt, they are consuming from the local route controllers. And the basic idea is that the state in RIS1 and RIS2, RIS3 in Frankfurt is, is always the same in all of them. Either there's no state at all because it was down and still starting or they are basically synchronized because they get the same, the very same input from the routers. And then the route controllers again get the very all get the very same input from the RIS instances, and they all execute the same algorithm. So they come to the same to, to the to the same um, uh, to the same routing view basically, and they all stream it to the route agent. And the route ag agent then de 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 duplicates the information, um, and then once the route is there, it gets programmed to the into the to the CDN routing table via NetLink. So we have a few minutes to talk about the issues we've encountered. So with the Go NetLink package, that's not official package, but it's uh, the one mentioned here, uh, we had the issue that we were not able to write multiple paths with MPLS encapsulation to the kernel um, because the NCAP attribute attached, uh, was attached to the wrong object. Uh, there was a pull request. Uh, it's not waiting for merge anymore. Uh, it's merged, it's done. Uh, there was another issue with BMP uh, in JOS. Uh, the router has sent an incomplete BGP open messages in in peer up notifications. Um, and it only did that when the peer router sends exactly for, uh, four byte AS and, and add path capabilities. When we added another capability like route refresh, it was gone. Like there's no real explanation why it is that weird. Um, and I never got an answer from the vendor why it is, that, why it is or was that weird. Um, and it was only happening when we used the allow from statement in Junos instead of neighbor statement. Um, yeah, so in the BGP open message, op uh, optional parameter were, were missing in the end under these conditions. And then we were not able to see that actually uh, add path was being um, uh, negotiated here. Um, so we failed on decoding some messages. Um, this is another funny thing. Uh, I try, I, we've, config we've configured hundreds uh, of LSPs on some of our routers, uh, the static LSPs we need for forwarding. And as soon as I have 100, more than a hundred on a Q of X 10K. Uh, and I do a show LSP brief, whatever. I don't remember exactly what command it was. Uh, pipe display XML. Uh, I got invalid XML. That's just a uh, one closing uh, MPLS static transit LSP brief tag here too much. Um, if I just remove that manually, it was valid XML again. Um, and then somebody on Twitter told me, yeah, why don't you use the JSON out? I was like, okay, pipe display JSON. And then suddenly, um, yeah. I just got locked out with a sec fault. Um, and I got, there was some Linux issues. So as I said, you need F MPLS GSO. Um, otherwise, the TCP over MPLS anchor broad is unusably slow, like 70 kilobytes per second, uh, on a route that usually made a, a one and a half gigs. Um, what you could see interface TX drops and random chunks of segments were missing. Yeah. Long story short, mod probe MPLS GSO solves the problem. Um, then we had this issue recently that uh, I was not able to delete tunnels. Um, but deleting the tunnels is actually intended as a cleanup mechanism to reliably drop all SDN routes. So in, in case something goes t terribly wrong and you want to stop everything, you just stop the, 
the route agent and the route agent will just delete all the tunnels and because deleting the tunnels it will drop all the routes. Unfortunately in kernel 4.13 it may block forever with this message. Um, waiting for tunnel name to be to become free usage count equals one and it just blocks forever. Uh, the only thing that solves the issue is rebooting. Um, also interesting thing is that MPS level routes um, are black holding on kernel 5.2. So we upgraded two boxes to kernel 5.2 and suddenly no traffic was coming out anymore. It's just tiny disk cards, no error counters. So we added a list of allowed kernels into the agent. So the agent only starts on kernel versions that we've uh, verified are actually working with this. And another funny thing is that multipath device only next stops for IPv6 actually are not supported on Linux. So you do IP-6 route replays, whatever, and then you have two next stops just with, a, with an interface um, because it's a tunnel. It's a point-to-point -point tunnel. There's no need to have a next stop IP address. Um, you get the zero message. Device only routes uh, can not be added for IPv6 using the multipath API. And then I Googled that phrase and I found this really, that I found an email basically that um, where that patch was submitted um, that causes this message. Um, and that email they wrote really IPv6 multipath is just full bad beyond prepare when it comes to device only routes. So do not allow it all. Well, yeah, it's really fucked up. I checked the code and it's really fucked up, but I found a solution. Um, we can just add an next top IP address here via fe 80 colon colon one. That IP address doesn't exist on the, on, on the opposite side or anywhere. It just avoids having the message and actually it makes the thing work. Um, yeah, the state of the rollout currently is uh, we are running it on video recording machines only, which are forwarding like 12 gigs per second uh, in peak in the evening. Um, and we are pending deployment for dedicated SDN controllers at the moment. Um, and the traffic engineering controller uh, is also pending. Um, I guess that will be there in the next months. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, I really made it in time. Um, I would like to give the word back to Donald.